Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's Casual Friday podcast, I have tidbits. I'll talk through my choice of tools, techniques, and materials for a work in progress. And I explain how I collaborated with a knitworthy gift recipient to plan and design a knitted item that's exactly what they want. So let's get started. This tidbit came to me from Wovandi on Ravelry, and it was a link to a website and podcast called Haptic and Hue, which covers various topics that have to do with textiles. So they're currently in their third season and episodes come out weekly, I believe. I listened to the final podcast of season one. I just wanted to, to pick something that sounded interesting to see what it was about. That one was about miniature mannequins. And they talked about how these miniature mannequins were the, the means of communicating changes in fashion back in an era before uh, magazines and other methods of communicating design would have been feasible. Within the podcast, they are interviewing a man who's a curator at a museum called the Mary Hill Museum of Art. It's in the state of Washington here in the US. And they have this really incredible collection of these little Pandoras that were used post World War One or World War Two, they were uh, created in France to just sort of as a post-war relief of showing sort of the luxury or ability of of makers in France. And you can see an online digital exhibition of those little miniature mannequins through a link that I'll leave down below. So I'm gonna leave a link to the, the podcast website um, as well as, as to the museum that has this particular set of mannequins on display. This tidbit showed up in my Twitter feed. It's about a woman named Harriet Powers who was born into slavery in 1837 near Athens, Georgia. She was known as a really amazing quilt maker. She won all sorts of prizes and her work was exhibited during her lifetime. And only two of her quilts are known to still survive. One is held in the Museum of Fine Art in Boston and the other by the Smithsonian Institution. And it, it, her story is, is fascinating to me. Um, people really loved her quilts, but at the same time, she was somewhat taken advantage of, as makers even today can be taken advantage of. There was somebody who really admired her quilts and wanted to buy one from her and she didn't allow it. But then later uh, when she was in real financial need, she agreed to sell one. She gave a price of $10 to the woman who wanted to buy it and who then talked her down to, to $5. It just it makes me makes me, <laughs> me so mad uh, just thinking about it. I'll leave links to images of her quilts down below so you can take all the time that you would like um, really examining them because they are really, really amazing. This tidbit came from the comments on one of my videos and I'm not even sure, it may have been last week's Casual Friday, I'm, I'm not sure. It's about another YouTube channel, it's called, and I believe I've talked about this YouTube channel before, John Arvin Textiles. And I think the video that I shared before was just on how their mill works, which is fascinating to see how wool is processed through the mill, how it's carded and how it's turned into yarn and, and all of that. This particular video that I'm going to link to below, I'll link to the channel in general too, in case you want to subscribe to the channel. This particular one is on grading wool. So not too far from their mill is the place where the wool is graded. And um, so if you're interested in seeing how that's done, uh, you, you might want to watch that video. I'll leave a link down below. Last week, I was talking to you about how I use stitch dictionaries 
to modify and design a Christmas stocking that I've been knitting for my family for a number of years. So I just walked through that process of, you know, how I picked the stitch patterns, what do you have to think about, how you can uh, steal good ideas from existing patterns, and then how I went about choosing the layout in terms of the color and things like that. So uh, I finished knitting my daughter's stocking. I still have some ends to weave in. Then what I was doing next is knitting a stocking for her boyfriend, Sam. I still have to do the heel, that isn't done yet. Now that I've told you about the, sort of the design process, I want to talk to you a little bit about the choices I had and the choices I made uh, in terms of the tools and materials I use as well as some of the techniques I use. Because knitting, there's always multiple ways of getting to the same endpoint in knitting. And often there isn't a right or wrong choice. It's just what do you prefer? You might prefer something because it's easier uh, you get a better result or it's just like, this is the one that you can remember. <laughs> That's how I used to choose. It's like, well, what are my choices and which one do I feel like I can remember without having to look up again later? For these two stockings, I made some changes uh, from what I had done in the previous eight stockings that I'd knit for my niece and my nephew and their families. Uh, it was just because the opportunity presented itself and also because after knitting so many of them the same way, I was looking for possibly <laughs> making a few changes just to keep things interesting for me. That's a lot of uh, why I make changes in how I knit something is just to keep it interesting, not because I think something is better than another way. I will often, I'm gonna do it this way for a while and then I get uh, really comfortable with it, I really like it and then I get bored and I wanna try something different. So that's really what was going on here. So the traditional way of knitting something that is a small circumference is to knit it using double pointed needles because you just wouldn't have a circular needle that would be small enough. These days, we often will use a longer circular needle to do small circumference items or two circulars or there are more and more circular needles that are shorter and shorter in circumference. I tend not to use small circumference knitting needles because the tips have to get shorter and shorter and those hurt my hands because of the way that I knit. So this is a like 32 inch circular needle. This is what I knit most things on is a 32 inch circular needle. And then I just change the technique that I'm using depending on the circumference of the item. So if it's a large thing like a sweater, I can just knit in a standard circular method. If it's, if it's sort of medium circumference, it's smaller than 32 inches, but larger than say 20 inches, then I could use a technique called traveling loop. I've got uh, videos on, on both of those uh, at the top. Or some people like to use the two circulars method. So you could have two, you know, one circular needle for each half of the round. I don't like that technique personally. A lot of people love it. I really like to minimize the number of tools that I use. It just, I just find it easier. I just find the needle that has the right tip and if it's 32 inches, then I can use it no matter what. In the case of this uh, stocking though, it's in stranded color work. And that means if you are working using magic loop, you basically are working across half of the stitches and then you're kind of turning the corner and working the other half. So we kind of have this sharp corner here and you can have this trouble on double pointed needles as well. So you have to find a way to manage the floats the yarn that's being carried behind that isn't being used so that you don't cut the corner too much and make the, the float too short and then you don't leave too much slack so then the stitches end up sloppy. So you have to kind of be careful with that. Now one of the problems with this particular stocking and the stranded color work is that I think every single one of these stitch patterns has an odd number of repeats, a odd number of, of multiples. So this is a 24 stitch multiple, so the, and I have 74 stitches, so I have three of them. So you only see half of the snowflake here. So after I've worked half of the round, if I turn this way, I, I can sometimes 
miss the visual clues that help me see if I'm knitting the correct color at the beginning and I, I might get off and I have to take them out and and uh, and fix them. So I've knit most of the stockings that I've done with this pattern. I have knit with Magic Loop and I just decided I'm going to try it with a 16 inch needle. Now a 16 inch needle is bigger than this and so what that means is this it stretches the stitches a little bit and that really helps manage the floats and keeps the floats from getting too tight. It, it causes the fabric to be a little stretchier and it keeps the floats nice and relaxed once the fabric can go into its uh, final shape. It also eliminates that corner. I can just, as I'm working around here, I can see the full snowflake as I'm working around it. So I decided I was going to use a 16 inch needle. Now I don't love 16 inch needles because these have a four inch tip and my knitting style sort of, I, I need the, the tip of the needle to kind of be pressed up against the side of my palm and they typically aren't quite long enough and I can knit with them but it's not as comfortable. So it's a disadvantage for me. Some people manage them just fine but that disadvantage was offs offset by the advantages I gained um, by managing the floats and being able to see uh, my pattern as I went around the midpoint of the round. So that was a choice I made. Now, uh, the heel and toe that I chose to make, let me show you on my daughters. The, the heel and toe I chose to use are exactly the same. So it's it's a, a standard, it would be called a wedge toe if you were doing this on an actual sock. Um, and when you use it on the heel, they call it a peasant heel or afterthought heel. So the reason I really like uh, using this particular heel and toe is first of all, they match each other in a stocking, which I like. And because the heel doesn't have to be worked until later. So I can work all of the stranded color work. And once I get all of the stranded color work done, then I knit the toe and then I can go back and knit the heel. And so for this, I washed and blocked it and now I can do the heel. Um, so I, I got all the washing and blocking done and then I can do the heel and that's not um, something I need to worry about so much for, for washing and blocking. The other reason I chose this particular heel and toe is that because I'm doing stranded color work and I need a specific number of stitches in the round, I didn't want to use a heel flap and gusset construction because that would change the stitch count at the beginning of the foot. Some stockings do use a heel flap and gusset and those stockings tend to sometimes have a plain colored foot or some other thing going on with the design where it's not going to be a disruption. So some people really like using short row heels and you could certainly do a short row heel and then you could do a short row toe as well. So those could still match. The thing that would be a little bit more challenging or different would be that if you knit the heel and toe exactly the way you would in a real sock, the toe and the heel are going to be um, bigger than this. Because the stocking foot is so much shorter, I really wanted to modify the heel and toe so that it's a little bit rounder. So I started out with 72 stitches and like for any standard heel or toe, I wanted to end with 24, which is about a third of what I started with. When I had eliminated half of the stitches I needed to eliminate, I, I was down to 48 stitches on the needle. I'd eliminated 24, I had another 24 to go. I switched from decreasing every other round to decreasing every round. And so that created a shorter, a rounder heel here and I did the same thing for the toe. You wouldn't do this in a real sock because these, these heels tend to be shallow as it is. That would just make something too shallow. I made that choice specifically for the stocking, just for the proportions and, and the aesthetics of it. Certainly isn't required. Many people will just use a regular sock pattern and just knit it as a Christmas stocking. And it will look absolutely fine. You'll have a longer foot and the toe and the heel will look in proportion. It will be fine. Um, but this is a choice that I made um, for that technique. And so certainly for the heel and the toe, because I was getting to a very, very small circumference, I did use Magic Loop for the, the toe and the heel.
So I used the 16 inch needle for the entire um, stranded part of the stocking. And then when I switched uh, to uh, the toe, then I started using Magic Loop. One of the things that I always do with these stockings is I line them. And this is just something I did from the beginning. I didn't, I never had a Christmas stocking, certainly not a knitted one. I was concerned about the stranded floats uh, catching, like if, if the stocking was, was um, filled with things like little corners of cardboard or whatever might catch them and, would, and might pull on it. That was a concern I had. I don't know if if it was a legitimate concern or not, but it was a concern I had. And so I've always lined them. And I, in the past, I've chosen to line with poly fleece. And I've, I did that for a couple of reasons. One was it comes in a million colors. And when I was knitting these for my niece and nephew and her family, everybody wanted different color combinations. And so it was pretty easy to find a color of polar fleece or poly fleece that would match the stocking reasonably well. And the second reason was that uh, poly fleece has stretch in one direction. And so what I would do is I would make sure that, that it, would, it was stretching the width so that it would stretch a little bit with the stocking. The stocking isn't going to stretch a, to a whole lot because it's stranded, but it stretches a little bit. And so the lining would stretch as well, but it wouldn't stretch in this direction. And I thought maybe that would give it some stability. If it was a full stocking, it would keep it from stretching out. Again, I don't know if that's a legitimate concern, but it was something I was thinking about and trying to prevent. And so that is why I chose poly fleece. And then the third reason was that I knew that when I, I seamed the two pieces of the lining together, I could trim very close to the stitching and I didn't have to worry about the fabric raveling. So if the seam ever opened up inside the stocking, it wouldn't end up being a shredded mess. It could be repaired and it wouldn't be an issue. So those are the three reasons that I chose poly fleece. Now the last stocking I knit was for my grandniece and I ordered the fleece online. It's the pandemic and it's a lot easier for me to just order it online and do curbside pickup or have it mailed to me. And it turned out the fleece that I got was very thick. And so it kind of bunched up even though I tried to make it as narrow as I could. It was a, a little thick inside. And, and I had also ordered fleece uh, for Nina and Sam's stockings, and it was also on the thick side. And so I thought, I'm just going to go to the fabric store and see if I can find a thinner poly fleece. They actually had some uh, wool felt. This is actually a blend of wool. I think it's like 20% wool and 80% rayon, something like that. It's a little bit of wool. And, and it only comes in five colors. Well, I'm doing a green and a red Christmas colors. They had green. It's not the best match for this, but it'll be inside. And they had um, two colors of red. They had this darker red, and then they had like a bright Christmas red. And then I think they had gray, and maybe they had a gold. They only had like five colors. So there wouldn't have been the, the big choice that I had with uh, fleece. And it doesn't stretch, which that's okay. It doesn't have to stretch. Um, and certainly going to keep the stability in the length, which is something I wanted. But the, the thing that I really liked was that it's not going to fray um, just like the fleece doesn't, uh, doesn't fray. So I can trim very close to the, the uh, seam lines and not worry about it fraying. So it is much flatter than the, the poly fleece was. And in fact, I've got, got Nina's inside hers and I really like it. It stays nice and flat. Um, it's not all um, bulky from the fleece on the inside. So uh, I, what I ha have to do still is weave in uh, yarn ends and, um, and then just sew this in. I just usually go by hand sewing around the top right underneath um, the Latvian braid. I, I put a four inch I-cord on here um, so that it can be hung. I haven't done Sam's yet. Those are some of the materials and tools I use. There's one more tool that I used that I hadn't had before. When I made my niece's or grand niece's stocking, I uh, used a method that I've used for years to block the strand of color work, which is to use a wooden spoon and smack it. I did a video on that a couple months ago when I, when I was doing her stocking, which I'll link to above and below. And 
somebody in the comments said, oh, like a spoon shaped spurtle. And I didn't know what a spurtle was. Well, it turns out a spurtle is a wooden spatula. There's different kinds of spurtles. There's cylindrical ones that are used for stirring porridge, I guess, in Scotland. But there are these square kind as well. And so my brother is a woodworker and I knit socks for him fairly regularly. And I thought, well, this would be an interesting thing for, uh, that he could probably do for me. And he would do willingly <laughs> because socks. Uh, so I asked him to make me a spurtle and he made me two. He made me this big wide one and then this longer narrower one. And I got them in the mail right before it was time to, to block Nina's stocking. So I used it on hers. I just loved it. And so I also used it on Sam's and I'll show you a little clip of me uh, smacking this. I think I'd use the big one if I had like a sweater or just something that was much larger. I'd probably use this one could be a wider uh, surface. But this works just fine uh, for the stocking. I wanted to tell you one more thing that I did that was different in these stockings than in previous stockings. And that is I changed the way that I managed the yarns as I was work doing the stranded color work. In the past, I've always used the method where I hold one yarn in each hand and used, handled the background color uh, with my right hand and the foreground color, like the pattern color with my left hand. And that produces what are called parallel floats. So you can see on the back of here, you see how the blue yarn is always on the bottom and then the white yarn is always just above it like that. So these are what are called parallel floats. So you can manage the two colors for the entire round. They aren't tangled around each other. Um, and if you're doing something like a true fair isle uh, design where sometimes the, the background color might change. I don't have the background color uh, changing in this example, but I do have the foreground color changing. Uh, that can happen a lot um, in Fair Isle where you're switching, uh, the background might go from dark to light to dark and the foreground might go from light to dark to light. And so trying to keep track of which of these two colors is the foreground and the background is, is helpful. It's helpful to use parallel floats so that you always know that, well, whatever's in my right hand is the background, whatever's in my left hand is the foreground. Uh, that can be really handy. In Fair Isle knitting, which is a specific subset of strand and color work, parallel floats are part of that tradition. It's a requirement. It isn't a requirement in any other strand and color work. Uh, it's an option. And so it's an option that I've always used for these stockings. And it worked really well for these where there aren't a lot of, uh, of stitches in one color before you change. That's another hallmark of Fair Isle knitting is that you don't have too many stitches in a row that are of one color before you switch to the other. So the parallel floats always worked really well in this section for my previous stockings, but they were a little bit more challenging in these, which are more uh, in line with Norwegian designs. In fact, if you look at the snowflake here, so I, I mentioned this is a 24 stitch multiple. In the center, there's one white stitch which means there's 23 green ones before the next white stitch. You'd never see that in a Fair Isle design. So if you do have that kind of a situation, you're gonna end up with a long float unless you find a way to trap it. So with parallel floats, the way you do it is typically use a method called weaving. And again, I've done videos on this as well. Um, but the weaving method that traps it, you can usually see a little blip of the color in between um, two of the, main colors. You can just see a tiny little blip. And the other thing about Fair Isle is because you have these parallel floats, whichever one is riding on the bottom, when you have a single stitch, it's going to appear larger. It will be larger when you switch to a color. That first stitch of a foreground color will be a little bit larger than the rest. Um, that's just a part of that, those parallel floats, that one that rides along the bottom is going to create a larger stitch. Once you've created the first one, they tend to, to uh, even out. 
So in a design like this where you have a lot of single stitches, you're going to see a lot of enlarged stitches if you use that method of parallel floats. So there is another method which is called rotating floats, which is when you switch colors, you bring the new color under the old one, just like you would if you were doing intarsia. And that causes the stitches to remain the same size. And you can also twist colors around each other if you have a long span like this, and then they don't blip through the front. So here's what the rotated floats look like on the back. You can see that they're not what is an above and below. You can see that kind of angle like that. So this produces stitches that are more even in size and can, and can help you trap floats without them showing to the front. But when you're bringing the, the yarns around each other, they twist. And so you have to untwist them at some point. So what I did, because these patterns are symmetrical, is I worked the first half of the round uh, by bringing the uh, one yarn under the other to twist it. And then when I worked the second half of the round, I, I twisted it in the other direction. So by the time I got to the end of the round, they were evened out. I didn't want to do it randomly. I wanted to have it consistent because one of the, the byproducts of twisting it around is that the stitches will sometimes skew a little bit in that direction. And if they're skewing a little bit, always skewing in that direction, you don't notice it. But if you have one row of stitches that are skewing this way and the next row they're skewing that way, that can look a little uneven. So, um, so my solution was to, to work half the round always in that, in that way and the other half in the other way. And I think it worked out really well. Uh, I find it more time consuming than the parallel floats, but I did like my results in this section right here. I decided to go ahead and do the rotating floats for these sections, even though I've always had uh, success with uh, the parallel floats, just to see if I cared, like if it made a difference, if, if it mattered to me. And I don't think it ultimately mattered too much. You can see I've got a little mistake here. I need to do some duplicate stitch right here to cover up those stitches before I put the lining in. This usually happens at least once. <laughs> just go back later and fix it with duplicate stitch. While my daughter Nina and her boyfriend Sam were here staying with us, I asked them if there were any things that, anything that they would like me to knit for them for the winter. And so we went to a local yarn shop called Stephen B to pick out yarn. Nina had been talking to me for a while about the popularity of balaclavas. So we looked through the Ravelry patterns at different kinds of balaclavas because there's a huge range of balaclavas, like huge. <laughs> and she found one that she liked by Petite Knits called November Balaclava, which has, uh, the designer refers to it as a feminine fit for the balaclava. So it covers the head, but it doesn't come like super forward like this. It, it kind of is, does cover the ears and then there's ribbing underneath, but it leaves the face exposed and you can see like bangs or fringe if you are British, uh, you could see your hair a little bit still. The pattern calls for a worsted weight yarn held together with a mohair yarn to give it that little bit of, of uh, fuzz. So uh, we went to the yarn shop and we asked Sam, did he want to go as well? He's a graphic designer and he really appreciates the things that I've knit for him. He was really interested in just, you know, seeing what the yarn shop was like. So we picked out the yarn for Nita, and then he, he said that he had been talking about wanting a snood. And I said, you're going to have to define to me what you think a snood is, because I knew two versions of it, and I wasn't sure that either one of those was what he meant. Over centuries in the past, a snood was like a hairnet that you could use to, to keep the back of your hair out of place. That's one definition of a snood. And in recent years, I've seen the term snood used for a women's accessory that was kind of like a loose uh, cowl, like sometimes they call them smoke rings, some people call those snoods. And so it's something that will just stay around your neck, but then you could pull it up uh, over the top of your head if you needed to a little bit more uh, warmth. I'd seen those also called snoods, and I wasn't sure if that's what he meant. And it turns out what he, what he wants is a regular length scarf, but in a loop. He wants a loop scarf that he can wrap a couple of times around 
uh, his head. And then I began looking and snood can be used to as a cowl. It could be this infinity scarf. It could be a lot of different things. Basically, it's a loop of knitted fabric and it could vary in length depending um, <laughs> on your own terminology or what it was, how, how it is you wanted to use it. We determined that what he wants is basically a full length scarf, except he wants it connected at the end so he can double wrap it. He found some yarn that he liked. He found a Malabrigo Rios, which is a cattle dyed tonal yarn. And there's always an issue when you have these kinds of tonal yarns in that if you need more than one skein, some yarns might do a better job of transitioning from one skein to another where it's, sometimes they can be a terrible match. So we took out, I think there were five skeins there and I wasn't sure how much we needed because at the time we didn't know how long that scarf was going to be. Uh, we didn't figure that out till later. So I knew I would need two skeins for a regular scarf, 200 gram skeins of worsted weight yarn for a regular scarf but I thought this one might end up being longer. So I got a third just to be safe. I don't think I'm going to need all three. I think I'm only going to need two, but my husband really liked the yarn. So I'll use the third one as a hat for him. But then we needed to decide, well, what kind of stitch pattern did he want to use? So I thought what would be ideal would be for him to look through this book. Um, this is called Sequence Knitting. It functions, uh, in a couple of different ways. I, I think of it as one of my stitch dictionaries, but it's a specific type of stitch dictionary where the stitch patterns in here are a multiple of some number of stitches. And you just work those, that multiple forever. Um, but there's a little bit more to it. So let's say that the stitch pattern is, the stitch pattern we chose for him is knit three, purl three, knit one, purl one. So that is a multiple of eight stitches. But the trick with sequence knitting is that the number of stitches that you cast on is not equal to a multiple of those stitches. So rather than using a multiple of eight stitches, this particular stitch pattern calls for a multiple of eight stitches plus two. So you're not working with an exact multiple like you would if you, if you were doing knit two purl two uh, ribbing, you'd cast on a multiple of four stitches and every row you'd work as knit two purl two and you'd get that ribbing. So the idea here is that you end up with these really interesting stitch patterns. It's really easy to remember so you don't have to take a pattern with you. It's really good for travel knitting, it's really good for TV knitting, uh, any kind of or, uh, commuting, that kind of thing. So you just don't have to keep referring to a pattern, but it's interesting enough. It keeps the knitter engaged and it produces interesting fabrics. So what sequence knitting has in it is just a ton of different sequences. And then she shows you what they look like on the front and on the back. So there's three types of ways that you might use a, a sequence. And one of them is that you would work every single row exactly the same. So there's a very famous type of sequence called mistake rib. And it's a multiple of four stitches plus one, or you could do a multiple of four plus three. But the stitch pattern is knit two, purl two. So you just keep knitting, you just keep going knit two, purl two, knit two, purl two, till you get all the way to the end. Well, when you get to the end, you're not doing, you're not finishing a full repeat. You're either gonna be working one stitch or you're gonna be working three stitches of the repeat. And then on the next row, you start over with the knit two, purl two. So you're always knitting every row exactly the same. But because you have some extra stitches, the stitch pattern isn't lined up the way it would be with regular ribbing. And instead you end up with this really interesting pattern where you have a column on each face of the fabric, you have a column of knits, a column of pearls, and then you, and then you have, which are divided by a column of garter stitch. And that will look the same on both sides and it will lay flat. It's really great for scarves. It's something I've used a lot for scarves. It's just something a little bit more interesting than just working regular ribbing. So the next type of sequence is a serpentine sequence where wherever you end up in the sequence, when you get to the end of the row, you continue with the stitch pattern at the beginning of the next row rather than starting over at the beginning. 
So if you have a multiple, let's say with the mistake rib of knit two, purl two, if you ended your row with knit one, then when you turned onto the next row, you work the second knit in the knit two pattern, then you'd work your purl two, knit two, purl two all the way across. So wherever you end in one row, you're gonna start with the next stitch in the sequence at the beginning of the second one. So that's called serpentine. And then the third one is if you are working in the round, because when you're working in the round, you're not going back and forth, you're always going in the same direction. And so in that case, you have some spiraling techniques. So how do you create extra stitches in your repeat so that the pattern will spiral around? So it's really interesting. And if you like sort of mindless but engaging <laughs> knitting, and you do tend to knit a lot of uh, things where you don't want to think too much about it and maybe doesn't have shaping in it because if you change the stitch count then that's going to change how the stitch pattern works out. So this book is is really it's heavy, it's very sturdy, it has a library binding which makes it more expensive but it also means that if you have it laying flat on your table it will stay open. It won't want to um, to, to close up on you. So I really enjoyed this book. So I gave this to Sam to look through and he found a stitch pattern he liked, which I'm going to uh, show you next. And then I'm gonna show you how I went about determining the number of stitches I was actually gonna to need to make a scarf that, or snood, that was the width that he wanted. So Sam looked through a sequence knitting and he found a serpentine uh, pattern that he really liked. It was this one right here. And you'll see that you have columns of knits here and then in between you'll have two rows of reverse stockinette and two rows of stockinette. So you have kind of this checker uh, board of stockinette, reverse stockinette in between. And on the back side, it looks the same. So really what you have is a column of knits and then there's a column of pearls right next to it. And then you have the two stitches that are in stockinette or reverse stockinette. Um, over two rows. When I am going to create something like a scarf or something like that that's going to be square, I think about what size needle I would normally use and then what sort of stockinette gauge I would get. And I start with that assumption that I'm going to get a similar gauge um, with a knit purl pattern. And oftentimes I will, but this actually functions a bit like a rib because we have this column of knits that come forward and then there's a column of pearls adjacent to it that recede. It's going to, to cause the fabric to pull in a little bit. So it ended up a little bit narrower than I expected. And when I started out, right, you can see this is flaring a little bit. I started out with a size seven needle and I thought it was too floppy. So you do want scarves to have a bit of a drape, but this is a super wash wool, which means it already has more drape and it's more likely to stretch out. So I decided to, to go down a needle size and see what I thought of the fabric. So uh, this part right here has been done uh, with the smaller needle and I like this fabric a lot more, but it is it because it is pulling in a little bit, it does function a little bit like a ribbing. Uh, it's it's narrower than I want what I want. Now this stitch pattern is a multiple of eight plus, I can't remember how many stitches, some number of extra stitches. I think two stitches maybe, is it eight plus two? I think it's eight plus two. So I had 42 stitches originally, thinking that my stockinette gauge of five stitches per inch would give me something that was about eight inches wide. Um, but because I wanted to go down a little bit and needle size and because the fabric is pulling in, I ended up with something that's about six and a half inches wide. I did steam it. I tried blocking it to see what would happen and it wants to pull in once it relaxes. So I don't want to fight that, um, but I also want it to be as wide as Sam wants it. He said he wants it to be about seven and a half inches wide. So I have to add stitches in eight stitch increments. Uh, so this is going to be about an inch and a half uh, wider if I use 50 stitches. So I am just looking at this as a swatch to see, uh, which is what it is, to, to see how things worked out. And, and rather than continuing on with the 42 stitches, knowing that it's going to end up too narrow, uh, I am, because this is a little bit wider right here because it was a wider, uh, larger needle, I'm just gonna rip this out and start over with 50 stitches on the smaller needle, and then I'll know, I know that I will get 
uh, something that Sam is going to like. But a lot of design is swatching and experimenting. You can draw on your previous experience. I drew on my previous experience uh, to guess how many stitches that I would want to use. But I did need to experiment with the needle size as well to see what kind of fabric I like. I don't tend to work with Superwash a lot and I know it has more drape. So I, I started with my normal needle thinking, oh, I will have more drape because of the superwash, but it ended up just being floppier than I liked. So, um, so there's always, you know, experimentation anytime you work on uh, a design, even something as simple as a scarf. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.